Gentlemen, welcome to Do It Yourself web pages. Nice to have you all here. My name is Bill Slomanson with Thomas Jefferson School of Law in San Diego. I'm Wally Gassaway from the University of North Carolina. David Whelan from the Southern Methodist University School of Law. Uh, very briefly on our format, what we intend to do is we kind of have compartmentalized in principle about 15 minutes each and then 15 minutes for question and answer. I think what we have resolved to do based upon a meeting last night and this morning is to try to go back and forth with a little bit of crosstalk during one another's presentations and hopefully we'll be able to uh, uh, leave plenty of time for any questions you might have. So let me get right into the overview of why we are here. Essentially we are here for to try to give you a sense of Uh, do-it-yourself web courses and one of the things that I might suggest is that in the presentation that I'm doing uh, is I have all of the sites, AT&T, AOL, Geosites, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, those are all set up so that you don't have to take notes so in the remote event that anything I say is worthwhile you can come back to this page if you want and click on it so you can just start doodling or tuning out or planning your afternoon tours or whatever right now if you want. Uh, uh, and for those of you that might be interested in returning to the various resources that are on this particular page, I would suggest that you bookmark the page uh, so you can see that at the top. That's the little tilde, Slomans and DE present. And if you use that, that'll bring you back to this particular page, which uh, might be useful for you uh, uh, somewhere down the line. Uh, essentially, what I'm going to do is do a very brief overview of the website construction options that are available out there for those of you that are thinking of incorporating web technology into your teaching. I know that based upon discussions I've had over the last day or two, a number of you have already done that. But I also have a number of you who have web pages that are different parts or you have some things on a personal page, some things on your school's page or maybe some things on your own particular page and you're in the process of trying to figure out what the comparative advantages and disadvantages are. We won't have a whole lot of time during our basic presentations to go into that. I will talk a little bit about some of the things that you cannot do with TWIN or uh, uh, web course in the box, the Lexus alternative, which is virtual classroom, uh, uh, but at least we'll have an opportunity to share some views on this particular panel's perspective, which is that do-it-yourself is basically where, where it's at. When I started uh, putting together my first web page for a paperless e-class that I taught, there were 80 million web pages. There are now over 350 million web pages and twin EDU web pages, uh, web course in the box, those are a tiny fraction. All the others are do-it-yourself. So uh, given uh, that do-it-yourself is basically what we anticipate is going to be uh, uh, the wave of the future, we wanted to take a few moments to talk about where we are right now. Thus, I'll be talking a little bit about the .edu sites, the educational sites, uh, uh, also about the .com sites like AT&T and AOL, twin, virtual classroom, Netscape Composer, and then one other that I just found out about yesterday that I'm going to talk about very, very briefly. First of all, EDU sites. One of the, uh, one of the things that I was going through initially was all of a sudden I came home one day and walked in the door and said, honey, guess what? I have a web page. I wasn't quite sure what that was and I wasn't quite sure what that meant, but I knew that I could walk around and maybe even put on my business card that I now have a website, although it was a, a mere .edu. Uh, and I thought I'd take just a moment to point out some of the frustrations that I faced and some of our co the co-panelists faced whenever they were in the process uh, of trying to make some decisions as to just exactly how to incorporate the web into their teaching. Uh, some of the problems were control. If you have a situation where you have an administrator like David who is running things, David is going to be awfully busy because he's going to have a number of priorities. He's going to have a boss who's going to say, gee, I want you to do this, 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 or that today. And if there's 25 or 50 of us that are trying to compete for the staff time, then he's going to have some priorities of his own. And that's going to make it a little bit difficult for us to update on a day-to-day -day basis as I had to do whenever I taught my paperless course, uh, whenever I did my own site. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, uh, I have Syracuse 7 there. I don't know if there's anybody here from Syracuse, but I think those of you who were at the 1997 AALS conference had to be as impressed as the rest of us were in one of the breakout sessions, which was a standing room only that had maybe, I don't know, about 150 people packed into a room that was supposed to have like 75. And one of the questions that was asked at the beginning was, what is the size of your support staff? 
And I think there was a, a hush that came over the room, and just everybody was shocked to hear it whenever the Syracuse uh, librarian got up and said, well, we have seven people. Uh, so, so I don't think that the people in the audience uh, are at universities, or at least at my university, we don't have seven people. Uh, so what that means is that you're going to run into problems if you're going to depend upon the school to, to use its website or the faculty pages that we all, virtually everybody in the room has uh, as a vehicle for trying to put up information that you want, uh, particularly if you want to make changes on a day-to-day -day basis, as I found that I had to do. Uh, also, bribery, I think that I really mean that. You know, where I have the word bribery there, what I had to do was for the David who was at my school, I had to really go out of my way to develop a special rapport with those people, uh, those people, sorry. Uh, but with the people who were, I don't want to say it's us and them, David, and I didn't mean it was us and them. But, but I really had to go out of my way to spend a lot of time to try to cajole and do the kind of things and, hey, let's go to lunch and so that I can, you know, so I could bribe the person so I could try to move my way up on the priority list because I was very, very interested in teaching my school's first uh, paperless course. So what I thought I would do is point out with some specifics uh, some of the problems you have whenever you suddenly found out, find out as I did uh, uh, that I had an EDU site or website and I wasn't quite sure what that was. Well, when you have it, what happens is that you, if I can find my arrow, there it is. Uh, is that you find you have it, you go to your school's page, then you have to find the page that has faculty on it. Then when you go to faculty, then, and I'm sure this is typical of most of you, then you have to tell the person, you'll go through all these steps uh, to get to your particular site. So there's William Slomanson, and what I was going to say is, uh, you don't, when I talk about lack of control, would you want, would you buy a used car from this person? <laughs> I had no idea where this came from, and I've been, asked, I want to get this off real quick. So let me quickly get out of this. And basically, I had no idea where that came from, but I hate that picture, but I left it up at least for the Cali conference so that I could let you know the lack of control you have, because I have a very, very different picture that actually looks like me on my own web page. So basically, uh, uh, there are a lot of problems with control. Uh, that I think you should be thinking about in terms of whether you, whether you want to be in control yourself. And it's very hard to be in control if you're leaving it to somebody else. Uh, something that I think is, in my view, I know you're going to think that a certain person on the panel paid me to do this, but I was very, very impressed the night before I flew out from San Diego when David sent me this particular, uh, this is a fairly new project, uh, and uh, I'll just quickly say something and get to the page that I was really impressed with. Uh, and then maybe David can make a few remarks about course materials. This David set up at SNU, and look at that. And I think that is very, very impressive. Course pages by professor, and maybe David has a comment or two on yeah, this project. Uh, this may look uh, impressive, but it is really vaporware. Uh, our faculty have not started publishing a lot of materials. Uh, the links in the highlighted slide uh, are true links out to uh, some really good materials that our faculty have put up. And we were beginning to move towards uh, an environment where our faculty would publish out onto our server, and it would be really cool, and everything would work great, and you know, life would be wonderful. But we are now beginning to look at uh, solutions more like uh, web course in the box and things like that to solve this, rather than trying to do everything manually uh, on our own server. So if you stop by and you find a lot of this page left intentionally blank. Uh, that's what's going on. But I think it's a great example of some of the things that can be done uh, by uh, staff who's working on trying to make uh, some really significant contribution value added to the .edu pages. Uh, what I wanted to do is take a few moments to talk about the .com sites. Uh, for example, AT&T. Uh, what I've done is all of these are clickable so you can get them. I didn't want to really uh, get into what the details are on those particular page, but what they do have is, I have a little bit of problem with this, so I don't know if this one's going to come up. It wouldn't load this morning. But what they have is they have templates, and they are very, very basic templates that you can use uh, if you're going to create a web page and if you're an AT&T subscriber. Yes, sir? Are you referencing the wrong thing Essentially, yes. Well, yeah, but, yeah, so essentially what you can do, however, oh, okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so that's the reason why I can't get to it right now. So I think that gives you one message <laughs> as to whether or not it is a good idea to be able to try to go to these. So that's one of the problems. Uh, AOL, I don't think I had the same problem because I was able to get to that. So I know that there are, while I didn't use AOL, I do have uh, some colleagues who say that they used AOL and they thought it had some nice templates. But my experience has been that uh, these templates that are provided 
uh, are very much, in my view, what I call cookie cutter templates. Uh, because what they do is they're very, very basic and they're not designed for law profs who want to do a state-of-the-art course because I would think that you would want to have a course that's going to look really slick. Uh, and if you look at, and I thought what I'd do is I'd come up with, I found a number that were like this and I thought this would be one of the examples of the kind of templates that are available for you and the things that are available if you decide you want to go this route. So here's a page that I thought was particularly illustrative. So if you're going to do a state-of-the-art web page, I'm not real sure that this is exactly what you would want to do, but this is the stuff that's available out there. Uh, Twin, you can click on that, uh, or Web Course and Box, which is really uh, a separate package. It's virtual classroom, uh, and if, for those of you that haven't already visited those, I how many people out here already have Twin pages? We were just curious about that. Okay, it looks like about 10. Anybody have virtual classroom with Lexus? Okay, uh, I would urge you, based upon comments from people like uh, uh, David at SMU and Steve Soule here at uh, uh, Chicago Penn to have a serious look at Lexus as a viable alternative to Twin. I won't say anything more because my purpose is not to suggest that you use a particular product, but just to equate you with some of the products that are out there. Uh, what I thought I would do is take just a few moments to chat about some of the things that you can do with a do-it-yourself page that you cannot do with either Twin or Virtual Classroom by Lexis. You see the icon that is there with the turning pages. Uh, that, you cannot do that. You cannot do, uh, uh, you can't import graphics. And as you know, with my first web page uh, that I put up, I thought I would have a very, very professional page. And therefore, for me, what that meant was not having any graphics and not having any kind of GIFs or, or GAFs or JPEGs or anything like that. I had a number of colleagues who convinced me, however, that in this modern day and age, that the youngsters who are in my classrooms were going to want to see these kinds of things on the pages, and basically I decided to shift to this, and I got a, you know, I got, uh, uh, there are a number of programs that are out there, so you can very easily import uh, all sorts of graphics, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of them. Uh, so that's something that you can't do. Another thing that you can't do is frames. Uh, if you want to use frames on your website, which is kind of state of the art, and that's how you want to set it up, uh, you're not going to be able to, if you're in Twin or Web Course in the Box or Virtual Classroom, have a frame set up because they aren't that far along. And that's the way that you can have the little index down the left-hand margin side, which looks real slick. Uh, I tried to pick, not, uh, I tried to pick something that had color in it to kind of make the general point that whatever color you want, you can do it on a Web Course page uh, or on a, a do-it-yourself page because you can select 254, and I think now they're set up so that you can get any color you want because I have a graph now, I just realized in the latest version of the product that I used to create my pages, uh, there'll be page mill where you can pick whatever color you want and presumably that's limitless uh, to have your wallpaper in the background or to have the different kind of, you, know, you don't have to have green uh, links, you can have whatever color you want for your links and you can customize anything you can think of, uh, which is something you can't do with uh, either of these products. Uh, those, believe it or not, are cookies. That's as close as I can come to cookies. And I wanted to, and I had two of them there, uh, virtu uh, because I wanted to point out that uh, there are those of us, and I am one of them, who are very concerned about the privacy issues associated with cookies. Uh, a cookie is a program that inserts itself onto your, your uh, hard drive, either on a per session basis or maybe for the, the better part of the next year. I now have a special program that advises me anytime a web page that I go to is trying to insert a cookie. And I've gotten, uh, I would say within about the last month, almost every page that I go to has one. So whether you know it or not, most of the times when you click on to a web page, you're going to be asked for a cookie. Twin does that. Uh, uh, initially, uh, Lexus touted itself for saying, well, we don't have cookies. We don't do that. We had a program that we got from some university, and that was the basis for virtual classroom. Uh, for what it's worth, I got this rather interesting message whenever I clicked on the option for, no, I don't want to accept the cookie. Lexus is very nice about that. But I got this page which says, your browser must accept cookies to work with our site. <laughs> So in any event, uh, Lexus, and that's one change from the paper that I had done for Juris that's in your materials, uh, now they both use cookies. And there's some good reasons for it, and some of it makes sense, but I just think it's something you should be aware of and you should make the decision as to whether you want to discuss that with your students as a matter of, uh, quote, invasion of privacy. Uh, another thing that I thought I'd refer to in terms of differences between uh, uh, these commercial vendors uh, that are available and doing it yourself is uh, this is as close as I could come to giving you an informational link, and that kind of, uh, that's linking between pages. Uh, I had some, since I'm not a twin expert, uh, I think uh, Lolly probably is, 
I have some question as to whether you could link between pages, and I called the twin rep uh, at the 1-800 uh, uh, Westlaw number on Tuesday, and they said, no, you cannot link between pages. And I think maybe at this point, Wally might have a thought about what you can do link-wise. And no, linking is a, a problem. <laughs> That wasn't much of a thought, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was a thought. <laughs> yeah, I think that at least confirms that you can't link between pages. With do-it-yourself, you are limited only by your imagination in terms of the way that you can link. I have about 35 pages on my website, uh, uh, and I can link between them very, very clearly, and that's something that you cannot do. For example, if you want to have one page in TWIN or Virtual Classroom, the Lexus alternative for, say, your reading assignments, and another page in which you want to have on a separate page, uh, uh, something that has maybe old exams or whatever you can think about, uh, you're not going to be able to freely link back and forth between those. The TWIN rep, rep, when I dialed the 800 number on Tuesday, said that you can't link back and forth between those pages, and you can freely do that with do-it-yourself. Uh, another concept or another related theme uh, in terms of the twin and virtual classroom Lexus alternative is money. Right now, uh, Lexus is no charge. Uh, twin was no charge for the first year of its operation, so they could get uh, us to all think about uh, moving into that environment. Uh, as you all know, uh, the latest that I've heard, and somebody in the audience might know better than I, because of the twin person did not return my call after three days. Uh, uh, the amount of money is supposed to be $20 per student user, I understand. Is that everybody else's understanding? Uh, and that's just for this year. In 97 at AALS, when I first looked at TWIN, because they had a separate suite, I don't know if any of you went to the separate suite, I was then told that it was a $3.5 million R&D charge, uh, or R&D uh, uh, that had been put into TWIN as of that point. So it's $20 a year this year, and who knows whether it's going to go up or not in the future. When it's do-it-yourself, uh, presuming that you're not going to charge your students for accessing your own website. Of course, there's no charge and it's free. Uh, the last point that I thought I'd make at this point is this little gift, believe it or not, is a dog. And I kind of think of Pavlov's dog. I was trying to find myself an icon that would remind me of Pavlov's dog. And I guess what I have in mind here from Psych 101 from your first year in college uh, is the concept of the unconditioned response and the dog that just re re responds. Uh, uh, to stimuli, uh, and essentially one of the things that you might be thinking about is that, yes, TWIN uh, and Lexus are providing some wonderful, wonderful services for us uh, so that we can use the web and all of its power in order to be able to, uh, do, uh, uh, to incorporate technology into our classroom. But one of the downsides is that uh, the more of us who use TWIN and Lexus, uh, the more that our students are going to have kind of a conditioned response without even thinking about it that therefore they should use Twin and Lexus in law school and then use those products when they get out. And uh, those firms, uh, what's particularly is working on web pages, uh, and they have a rather grand program which is designed to try to get our students uh, to have uh, West pay for, or to have West set up their law firm web pages when they get out. So I think that's all fine and good. I think it's something that we as professors should be thinking about in terms of uh, uh, making sure that we have thought through whether or not uh, we want to uh, pretty much tie our students into a particular commercial vendor throughout their entire law school experience. Uh, I also want to take just a moment to chat about, actually there was one as of the time that I arrived, but now two uh, 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 word processing like programs that are out there which are one's free and one is not. One is Netscape Composer. Do I have anybody who's used Netscape Composer to create a page? Okay, so it looks like actually there are more, maybe about three times as many based upon the show of hands who have used Netscape Composer. That's free, and that's something that is available to you. This is the web URL that you can click on for Netscape Composer, and that can give you a little bit of information, and it talks a little bit about the things that can be done uh, through Netscape Composer. Another one that is available, in other words, what it does is it's very, very simple uh, from what I understand for those who know much more about it, uh, uh, and I've asked a few people uh, in the last few days, I've been told that it's very, very simple to uh, create content on Netscape Composer, publish it, and it's almost like using a word processor. Uh, I don't know if you have as much flexibility as doing it yourself, but at least that is a viable alternative that is out there that you might be thinking about. Uh, a sample page is from one of my fellow faculty members, and I just wanted to show you what you can do with it, and I think he did a wonderful job uh, on his Netscape Composer. Uh, real nice picture. <laughs> well, I, I think it's good. Uh, and he's got all sorts of information there, uh, and this is what he did in, in, in uh, Netscape Composer. The reason I wanted to refer to this particular faculty member 
uh, is that he actually has three sites. He has his .edu site, which he never uses, like me, and probably a number of you out there. He also has personal information on his Netscape Composer page. And then he has a twin page where he has information on it. So he's kind of caught between using not all three, but two of the pages, one for personal purposes, Netscape Composer, and one for professional purposes, twin. Uh, when it comes to do-it-yourself, for those of us who are on the panel, we all have our own pages. And we can pretty much combine uh, things that are personal, like publications, resume, and things like that. Uh, 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 with our professional stuff and all have it on a do-it-yourself page. So I think he will be moving, as I believe a number of you will be moving in the direction of uh, do-it-yourself somewhere down the line so that you have it all on one site. Uh, this is the, I want to take just a moment to talk about the site that I did. Uh, and essentially, I teach state civil procedure uh, in California. Uh, and, you know, in addition to Fed, you know, Fed's nice, gets them ready for the bar, but the problem is it doesn't prepare them for practice, and there's a number of differences between state and federal procedure in California. So what I did was I created this particular, oh, and by the way, you can't do tables like this either on Twin or Lexus. They have some there, as I understand it, that there's some tables there, but you can't manipulate them. Uh, so they're kind of like in template form, uh, at least on Lexus. I'm not sure whether Twin has tables. Lolly, do you have twin? I imported tables into Twin. Ah, okay. So what I did basically is I set up a situation where a couple of law students get sick on eating edible widgets, uh, and then they sue the deli, so on and so forth. Something that people at my school can relate to, because we have a deli of questionable uh, character. <laughs> I hope this doesn't get all the way back to California by the time I do. Oh, thank you very much, Pat. One of our, I'm sure you'll keep quiet, or else you'll bribe me. Or, okay. So what I did was here's my edible widgets case facts. I don't want to take the time to click on it now, but I put a client interview, I put a, uh, uh, an original complaint, and then I had three different problems. And I was able to set these problems up so that they could submit them at different times. Uh, for those of you that see that midnight, by the way, don't make it a midnight deadline. I learned the hard way the first time through what that can mean. <laughs> but I won't bore you right now, but it is interesting. Being up there at, mid being up there at midnight to make sure they met their deadline. And I'm sure you all know, by the way, that as I learned, uh, uh, my students could have learned the hard way by being penalized for being late. Is uh, I was there at midnight each time these problems came in for all of my students because a number of them, I have one in particular who showed it was 5 o'clock the next morning, even though I had it right there on my screen at 12 o'clock midnight. So uh, if you have deadlines in any of your courses, make darn sure that you're aware of uh, it's not actually in real time. And what I did basically is they could go to problem one, click on it to get the information. This is a demur. This is a summary of judgment. This is a protective order regarding punitive damages. And what I did was I set up everything on my site because you have a blank screen, you can do whatever you want. And ultimately, what it involved into was I had a table of contents that had all of the information they could possibly want on this particular page, uh, free email, honors code, grading system, so on and so forth. The one thing that I wanted to leave you with that I think is most critical, because I'm sure that there are a number of you out there, aren't there, who are thinking, do it yourself, like those three people up on the stage. Learn HTML. Go through all the grief and aggravation. You've been hearing over the last couple of days about non-tenured faculty member kind of put this on the back burner and don't even think about it because of the time associated with, particularly with Jane's presentation here yesterday morning at 9 o'clock. Uh, one thing I thought I would do is, is try to graphically make a very, very important point about how easy it is to do your own site. Uh, this, believe it or not, is a just say no. That's as close as I could get. I couldn't find out anything on the web that had just say no. So that's actually got a surfboard in there, but forget that part. This is just, <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if you could just say no to HTML and you wouldn't have to know jack about HTML? I have an HTML expert maybe two of them, but at least one of them uh, sitting up here on the panel. And I know very, very little about it because I was able to say no to HTML through Adobe PageMill. Now, there are a number of programs that are out there, but this is the one that I believe is the most possible. Do I have any Adobe PageMill users out there? Okay so, there, that, okay, so there's about 10 of us sitting in the room who know how easy it is to do your own page because you do not have to know HTML in order to be able to put this all together. Uh, the last thing, yes. Okay, the last thing I want to do is to leave you with uh, uh, a place that you could go to in order to find out what other people are doing. And I have recommend that you have a look at Jurist. How many people are familiar with Jurist? Everybody? OK, good. So what's beautiful about Jurist, I guess I won't have to spend any more time on it, is that you have all of these different courses. And these are do-it-yourself pages 
Bernie Hibbett says that almost 100% of the pages that are on here are do-it-yourselfers, and I think there's a message there. So with that, I will leave it and turn it over to Lolly. the twin queen, the beta test queen, going through three versions of twin before I finally got the courage to go forward with doing it myself. I am in no way an HTML expert. I don't know one bit about it. I, I came into this uh, in the summer of last year when there were already so many programs you could use uh, to be able to do it. I'm going to go very quickly over my experiences with Twin. I am very grateful to Wes for having given me sort of the courage to go off on my own because I don't think I would have done that very easily without the help that they gave. Um, the first year that we uh, actually used it at the University of North Carolina, it came about because of Steve Nichols, who is, if any of you know him, he's a, a wonderful cheerleader for Twin. Uh, and he did convince me that it was time to begin to do some of some of your, I wish I had one of him, <laughs> the way he really does things. But but uh, uh, that's the only photo I could find of Steve on the web. <laughs> um, the first version that I used was the first Lotus Notes version of Twin. Um, and we did have uh, an on-site full-time person at the University of North Carolina who worked with us and the students. Um, there were a lot of things I liked about it. Um, there were a lot of things that, that turned out not to be as positive. Uh, see my, oh, you can't, you don't have the light bulb yet. I had a great icon that they developed for me that first year. It was a light bulb that said intellectual property around it, and I sort of thought that was cool. Um, the disadvantages, though, um, were a lot of them were our own institutions' disadvantage. The display in the classroom was our problem, not, not with. And so we were dealing with trying to get the right kind of equipment and stuff. Uh, the distribution and installation of software for students was a bit awkward uh, in those early years. Part of it because they're dealing with so many different configurations of equipment and stuff for students. Um, but it was also a bit hard for faculty uh, because there was not as, as much help available as some of us needed uh, on the phone constantly, email and that kind of thing. Um, by the time I was ready to use it uh, for the fall of 1996 for my intellectual property course, guess what? There was a new version of <laughs> I still wrote a note space, so it was sort of like starting all over. Um, the classroom solutions were certainly better at my institution by that time. Um, but what Wes had begun to do was to make it l less locally customized. It now was a template for all of Twin. I lost my cool light bulb for intellectual property <laughs> and just sort of had the same icon for everybody else. Um, the last time I used Twin was in the fall, I mean in the spring of 1997, the first time I taught a cyberspace seminar. Uh, this is a totally paperless course as Bill was describing. Uh, there were many improvements. It was now a web-based <laughs> design, so I've been through three versions, each one considerably different. It was easier to use for the students by this time. Um, it looked better. Um, Wes did the HTML conversion, but the way they did it was you had to email everything to them, and it was about sometimes a day before it would show up. It was not instantaneous. Uh, we continued to have staff support, but now it was student staff rather than a full-time Wes person. The disadvantages we were beginning to see were lack of flexibility, um, no ability to integrate graphics. Now, I told you what I teach, intellectual property and cyberspace law, two things where the visual and the sound and all of that are extremely important. Um, students were also beginning to complain about the lack of flexibility. One of the good things that had happened, though, was it was working better with Mac than ever before. So I used the little war uh, between the PC and Mac graphic. It was starting to be better. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I didn't design that. <laughs> I, I, 
Um, by the fall of 1997, though, um, my own university had done something that uh, really made a huge difference. They were offering university support for faculty who wanted to do any web-based work. So this is not the law school, but the university itself. The first thing you had to do was create a personal home page. I won't uh, uh, click on that to show you, but I do want to show you what I was able to do with my intellectual property course. Uh, this is the basic home page. Now, when Bill says you can use colors, um, I'm sort of the color queen on all of this. <laughs> Anything, I want it to be bright. Um, I want students to like uh, looking at it, uh, all of that. So uh, I did a lot. Now, there, there are certainly some boring things like uh, exams on there and such, which I didn't make all of my exams colored when they hadn't been. Uh, but I was able to do a lot of things that I could not do, but I still am using a template. The template, though, is provided by the university. Um, and I will show you some of their stuff in just a moment. It is, uh, they recommended Netscape Gold at that time because that was the easiest for faculty. And they did, did recognize that many of us are not uh, technologically very sophisticated. Now, what I do um, with the uh, using the web is to create uh, a, a lot of charts, to cr use a lot of graphics, and I use these as a display in class every day. So each week I do a big display. Um, what I wanted to show you quickly was in the trademark section how useful it is to students when you're talking about a case to be able to see the trademark. Having taught intellectual property for about 20 years, that was always something students were asking for. Why can't we, why don't the casebook reproduce all the trademarks for us that we're talking about? Uh, and there would be a few, but never a lot, and certainly not in color. Now, one that turned out to be really important was there is a case that the well, casebook I use uses dealing with, and certainly most of the women in the audience will recognize these, but a coach bag case. I used to have to bring in my purses because the guys in the class didn't know what the case was about. I loved it. It was such a reverse from the usual cement mixer kind of stuff and <laughs> that we're always talking about. But this was, this was very useful because I found on the coach site was able to bring in the bag and the tags, which we were talking about in the trade dress case. Um, that's fairly straightforward. In the right of publicity section that I uh, do, there are a lot of cases, but I wanted to show you my favorite. <laughs> this is from a website called Tickle Me Elvis. And, <laughs> and I'm able to, to use sound by very easily. And now remember, for an intellectual property course, this is an important thing to do since recorded music and uh, is a big part of this. You like Tickle Me Elvis? I'm glad it's the fat Elvis. I don't know about you guys. Instead of the skinny one. Um, even in patents, though, there are some good things that you can deal with. One of my favorites is the old patent case, the uh, Hotchkiss versus Greenwood, which is known as the doorknob case. Well, I couldn't find an animated doorknob, but I did find an animated door, and the students could remember that just by having something that uh, uh, was easy for them to remember. Um, the reasons then that I decided to, to go and change really was because what my campus had done, excuse me, I went slightly too far. Um, my campus created what was, is called Simple Start. I sort of like that. It's for faculty. I like that name, Simple Start. Um, what they have done is actually uh, on the web, we are able to use all the web authoring tools. Uh, we can create uh, discuss, threaded discussion lists. Uh, all of that that you can do with twin. Now, I did not, I've never used the Lexus version, so I, that's the only reason I'm not referring to it. But I can basically do everything that I could do before. In addition, there's now a cadre of people on campus who have done web-based instruction, either totally web-based or combining it, as I do in my intellectual property course, with regular paper stuff. We have discussion lists. Uh, uh, seminars that we can attend, and I've gotten a lot of good ideas from non-lawyers on things to do uh, in the course. So I have found that extremely helpful. The best thing Simple Start does is you first have to go to what is called boot camp. It's two and a half hours, and even a law faculty can do that. Um, after the two and a half hours, then you're already starting to create your personal home page and your uh, class listserv and discussion list. Then as you try to set up your page, they literally provide staff to come and sit with you in your office at your computer if you need that kind of help. 
Now this was done jointly by our Office for Information Technology and our School of Information and Library Science. So it's master's students from that School of Information and Library Science along with the technical folks from OIT who have done this. They are available by email, phone, and then will literally come to your office and work with you. You can go there if you want to, but they do recognize many more of us are going to be working from our offices. So that has been extremely beneficial. Um, the last thing I, I wanted to show you, and many of you have probably done things much more exciting than this, but my cyber, cyberspace law um, homepage, not so much because of anything I've done, but the, the discussion list has just been amazing on there. I, I want to show you how much discussion from 15 students. <laughs> I mean, it's just really amazing. And none of it was crap. It was all course related. Well, I mean, you really always hear this stuff if people are talking about, you know, silly things that people post. These are all course related things, framing cases, library filtering, security breaches, things that really deal with the course. So uh, that has been an easy thing to do. This year, I required that students do um, websites for their projects. And I thought I would show you a couple of them. They make my website look like junk because, of course, in a course like Cyberspace, you get a lot of software engineers and folks. But instead of doing a research paper, I have had them do something that is now available on the web. And they were thrilled to be publishing that way uh, because it is now available for everyone. Uh, I really liked what they did historically about gambling from the time of the founding fathers all the way up to the, to the jurisdiction case now. Um, <clears throat> other ones that were especially good this particular year, uh, the one on telemedicine is an outstanding site uh, that uh, shows a number of the telemedicine sites and it begins to deal with the licensing and, again, jurisdiction issues. So um, I have gone from um, using twin to creating my own to having a paperless course to having students have a paperless course. And the evaluations for the, the cyberspace law class have been extremely high. Students saying that they felt they were doing something that was going to be useful to someone else. Another part of that is they've worked in groups to create internet policies and they are also on that home page if you're interested in looking at those. Um, some students, of course, already knew how to do websites. They were developing their own graphics for it. Others did not know how. So they have a skill now to take into practice. Uh, maybe we won't have to be teaching that for maybe three or four or five more years, and then by that time, students are all going to know how to do it. But I still think the value of publishing on the web rather than a paper that goes in the professor's file is a, a pretty important thing. Um, the last thing I sort of want to um, leave you with is honest and true. If I can do this, anybody can do it. Um, I want you to see the last graphic. You've probably all seen it. Uh, Bill, it's not going to show for some reason. It won't go down quite far enough. It's the Xena Warrior Princess one um, that says, you know, we need to be out there. Uh, it's on there, but for some reason the, it, the screen just won't drop quite low enough to do my own version. Okay. <laughs> I'm not taking my clothes off. <laughs> But the whole thing is, yeah, good, right? The whole thing is, <laughs> yeah, the whole thing for this is that um, really and truly, if I can do it, anyone can. I am not a technology guru. I'm um, interested in experimenting and talking to faculty around the country and others who are doing it. Uh, students have liked all of this very much. Uh, they get into it in a big way. And um, I'm already hearing back from students who are saying, uh, on the website I saw this, but haven't there been some later cases? So I don't know whether that's good that we're going to keep hearing from them forever. Uh, but maybe it is. Uh, so I encourage you to consider uh, creating your own website. It's an easy thing to do, and it's a great deal of fun. It is time consuming, but I think it's time well worth spending. Thank you. While David, while David is getting uh, set up, I was asked to make an announcement. The American Association of Law Libraries Computing Services Special Interest Section Education Committee, boy is that long, will meet Friday at lunch in room 520. Any member interested in suggesting and developing a topic for the 99 program should go to that lunch. Well, I've seen two good examples of uh, faculty who are using the web. 
uh, and have gone off on their own to uh, develop course pages and course information for their students. I think that's a recognition that uh, our students and our faculty on the technology staff side uh, are really needing some way to, uh, to uh, get access to information 24 hours a day. And uh, I think it's uh, the technology staff, the law librarians, the library directors, whoever's involved in technology who uh, need to come up with a solution for that. And I think the fact that you're all here is a recognition that uh, it's no longer a question of whether you're going to provide web courseware or discussion groups or web pages for your faculty or support them. It's, uh, it's really a matter of when you're going to do it and how much you're going to provide. And I'm hoping to uh, uh, maybe give you a couple of ideas of, of options that you can take, uh, take away with you. Um, let me give you a little bit of background about me. Uh, I'm you know, presenting, but in addition, as head of computing at SMU, I've got to find a solution which will handle our faculty needs uh, so that I don't have to worry about necessarily supporting different web websites like ATTNet and uh, uh, different uh, uh, HTML editors and so on. Um, when I'm looking for a solution, I'm thinking of something that, that will allow me to create uh, web pages, allow me to have an easy interface for my users to author uh, web pages and for me to administer the site. I need discussion groups. I need chat rooms. I need document collaboration. I need the ability to take parts of the site and allow everybody in the world to get to some parts, certain people to get into some parts by password, and then block other segments of the website by a particular IP address so that they can only get in from particular uh, machines in our law school. And I need to do all of this without redu reducing the responsiveness of uh, my tech staff for uh, faculty support. So, you know, easy, easy, easy situation. Throw into that mix some issues that you are uh, also probably facing. I've got faculty who can develop HTML pages on their own, like uh, Lolly and Bill up here. Um, they have no problem. In fact, they're not even interested in a law school uh, site because they like doing their own colors and their own graphics and their tables and all. I've got some faculty who don't know what HTML is, don't want to develop a web page, don't understand how a web page is created or, or what it is or how that graphic gets up in that corner. I've got faculty who don't want anybody but a certain number of our uh, law students to get access to their pages, and I want others who want access to everything. I need discussion groups, which will allow them to be anonymous posting so that uh, students feel freer to uh, post about whatever they want to uh, and not feel the inhibitions of uh, the classroom. And I have faculty who say, either you're accountable for your postings or you're not, so we've got to balance those two. Uh, I've got to find a solution that doesn't require me to be a programmer. I need something that I can plug in and not have to spend a lot of time customizing and supporting. Uh, and I need to find something that will run on NT uh, and an IIS server. So we're down to about two, maybe three products, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the options? From a technology standpoint, you've got two real options. One is outsource, give it to a vendor, and the other is bring it in-house. And when I say bring it in-house, it doesn't mean develop it yourself. It means just implement something on your own server. Why go with uh, a vendor? And when I'm talking about the vendors, I'm talking about West Group's twin. Uh, LexisNexis's virtual classroom, and uh, I believe uh, Amelon's Intercal also will host on their server uh, your web courseware. Some of the benefits are that you don't have to buy a web server if your law school doesn't have one. You don't need any hardware. You don't need to buy any software. The vendor has promised to provide you with support for the site and keep it up 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. And you don't have any staff training costs. I'm getting the uh, website up, getting the uh, website working, and getting your faculty and staff to using it because the vendor uh, is providing that, uh, that support. What about costs? Twina and uh, Intercal are both uh, for profit, and they are going to be charging you if you want to uh, choose them as a vendor. And that's, uh, ex you can expect that if you are going to be getting support from them. Uh, virtual Classroom is currently free, um, but time was free, and uh, I don't mean to cast aspersions against LexisNexis, but when you do choose a vendor, you uh, are subject to that vendor's change in uh, pricing policies. And uh, another thing uh, from a technology staff standpoint that you need to consider if you go with an outside vendor is that the vendor promises support. But what is the reality of support for your technology staff? And the reality is that you are the front line whether Twen is going to provide support or not. So you need to keep that in mind that even if you are going with an outside vendor, you uh, will still be expected to do some of the support. Some other questions to keep in mind when you're considering going with the vendor. 
are you willing to cede the content control of your law school website? And I don't mean so much the materials because the faculty will still be controlling what goes on to the twin or the virtual classroom site. But what about the look and feel? Part of what the law school website is is a marketing tool and you want to be able to show off some of the materials that you've got. Do you want to be able to make that available to people who are visiting uh, law students or interested in the classes that they're going to be taking when they get to law school? What about limitations of vendor solutions? Uh, for example, with TWIN, most of the uh, system is based on a discussion form or threaded uh, format. When you go to a virtual classroom, you have the ability to create some web pages, but you're really within the guidelines of the particular vendor's uh, solution. And do you want to limit yourself from the uh, what is becoming a very important web uh, technology? The law school is going to be looked at to provide this information to its students and faculty. Do you really want to send that out to a vendor um, when you're really then giving up all ability to control and move uh, and uh, progress on the, uh, on the technology that you, that you use in the law school? Now, you're probably beginning to tell from my, uh, my comments that I'm a little bit of a do-it-yourselfer, but uh, I have the ability to, to do it myself, not that I'm an HTML guru like Lolly and Bill suggest. Uh, I only play one on TV. But when you're, when you're developing your website, you have to develop based on, on what your staff can do. If you're from a law school with a library which has no tech staff for HTML web pages, trying a virtual classroom uh, and Intracal and any of these other solutions are, uh, are good deals, you know. You don't have to invest that staff in the, in, the, in, the, in, the pro in the product. If you have any ability or if you already have a web server, then I think it's worthwhile looking at some of the do-it-yourself tools um, because you can really provide a lot of functionality and decide sort of at your own pace what to provide and then meet your faculty needs, which are not necessarily cookie cutter. Your faculty may want particular things that no other faculty wants. Now, that may not be true. Um, for example, we don't have very much interest in chat, but discussion groups are something that I think uh, will, will probably be uh, implemented across the board. What about do-it-yourself? To do-it-yourself, you need to have sufficient access to a web server. Uh, that means either a web server in your law school which you can uh, put a robust platform on or else access to your ISP or your main campus web server so that you can implement a script or uh, other tools. You need to have staff who will train and support the faculty and the students. And you need to have staff who will support that server or the uh, particular segment of the server that you are, you are using. Costs. This is a bit fuzzier and it depends really on your situation. You might have to pay for a web server. You might have to pay for an ISP to support that. You might have to pay for staff to get the skills so that they can support the software that you implement. You might have to pay for the software solution itself. Like Intercal, there's another program called Top Class, Web Course in a Box, which is what Virtual Classroom uh, from LexisNexis uh, is based on. What about savings? How many law schools here already have web servers? So you're looking at wiping out that cost for uh, putting in hardware. You've got the software to run the, the, uh, the uh, solution on. And most of the solutions that I'm looking at today, unless you're looking at the really robust ones, uh, you can get started with freeware. As far as staff, we'll hope that your staff is already capable of running the web server and that it will be uh, just a small jump ahead to uh, be able to support the additional uh, programs and, and uh, solutions that you're looking at. What about hidden costs for uh, DIY? could be a sinkhole of your time. Your staff could spend hours and hours and hours supporting a product that doesn't work or doesn't meet your faculty needs. Uh, you may implement a solution that doesn't work and then have to readdress the situation and uh, come up with an alternate solution. Let's take a look at some of the alternatives. If you are starting off with a web server, and obviously many of you are, you may want to consider an all-in-one solution. And all-in-one solutions really are uh, Twin uh, and Lexus, uh, Nexus Virtual Classroom. Uh, and those are obviously post support, uh, vendor supported. They, they'll search your courseware for you. You will uh, not to do very much administration. Um, if you want to use another product on your in, on your in-house system, do it yourself. Uh, you may want to consider Intracal, Top Class. Let's see if I can. I'm almost there. and Web Course in the Box. Now, Web Course in the Box is the software that uh, LexisNexis is using for virtual classrooms, so you can really implement the virtual classroom on your own server. Um, which do you choose? 
It depends how much money do you have. It depends. Uh, I looked at the uh, top class solution for uh, my whole campus, which is about 10,000 users, and uh, the quote was about 40,000. Um, InterCal has a, uh, I think, an annual subscription fee, and it's based on the number of students who access. Uh, and WebCourse in a box is free. They'll also depend on what platform you're running, what software you're running for your your uh, your server. Um, top class web course in the box, and I think uh, Intercal all run on both uh, Windows and Unix. No. Yes, they all do. Um, but for example, web course in the box has not yet been uh, updated for IIS 4 for NT, so we're still waiting to determine whether that's going to be something that we want to implement or not. Each of these provides uh, discussion groups. Some ability to post pages, maybe customize a web page in virtual classroom. You can actually customize the look and feel. Uh, you can have a page that is actually disk colored. I love the term. I'm not sure how they chose the terminology, but the disk is, uh, is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> but uh, but you give up some of the, some of the functions that you might get uh, um, from a, a vendor program, like the document conversion through Twin. Um, things like top class uh, have a bit slicker interface, uh, as does Intercal. Intercal. Let me just click through to their site. Uh, they've got a really slick graphic for their uh, their look and feel. Now, one of the nice things that Intercal has uh, is uh, that they include calendaring uh, and gradebook, which are two uh, two unusual features. I'm not sure necessarily that you need them. Um, but they are certainly uh, interesting features. But this is the, the open face. So when you go with uh, a more expensive vendor product rather than a web course in a box, which is really just frames and uh, a lot of neat CGI scripts, um, you can sometimes get a better interface for your users. What if you don't want to do an all-in-one solution? What if you want to just do piecemeal? What if you don't have the ability to staff and support a, a product like WebCourse in a Box or Intercal, or if you don't want to go with Quinn, you still want to do something, you still want to provide uh, uh, Professor X with a discussion group, and he's the only one that wants something right now, and you want to sort of start off small, you can still do that, and you use it, uh, do that by implementing components. And the components will include things like forum software, Discus, it's a really nice piece. Eboard, eShare Expressions Interactive Suite has a, a discussion and chat. Hypernews, very well known uh, discussion forum software. Webboard 3 and Webboard 2, which if you buy building web conferences in a box from O'Reilly, it comes free with the book. Um, you can also go freeware, www.board, which is what we started with. Very, very simple to implement. I didn't know a lick of Perl. I still don't know a lick of Perl, and it uh, ran fine. Um, but you'll need to pick and choose out of these uh, pieces of software which are available, uh, most of them free on the internet, uh, to see if they really meet your needs. One problem we had with www board is that we had no way to authenticate who the user was and the fact they didn't want anonymous posting. So, obvious problem there. Uh, there's free chat available on the web. There's a quiz designer. Uh, and it's a matter of going out to these sites and finding software which can meet your needs. Uh, and you can actually build the same components which you would find in WebCourse in a Box or Intercal by taking uh, and implementing single scripts and piecing them together. But if you really want to get to a point where you're doing a lot of that piecing together, you should really think about going with one uh, monolithic unit which uh, will answer all the needs and uh, take care of the integration problems for you. File uploading, auto link generators, and uh, calendaring systems. And calendaring is really the one thing that uh, from all of the products that I looked at, uh, no one really addresses except for Intercal, and it's one thing that our faculty look forward for uh, uh, doing uh, office hours and things like that. Yeah, uh, just a quick comment on Intracal, uh, which is kind of the counterpart or the cost counterpart to my Netscape Composer uh, uh, discussion. They're having a presentation on Intracal at 10.30 in room C50, which is just below the auditorium. And finally, whatever you start with, and I think you really need to, I mean, you need to think about what you're going to do. There's, there's no ability to, to, to sit and decide not to do anything. Um, but based on your staffing and your ability to uh, finance any, any sort of uh, solution, um, find some uh, product or some uh, sort of working arrangement to get started with faculty publishing or even publishing yourself. 
um, so that you can give an example for faculty to build on. You can start small. You can start with your own little discussion forum. You can even start smaller by using links to uh, Lefts and Westlaw uh, from your web pages. Uh, I know that if you're in Twin, you can actually link to West resources. If you are uh, out on the web, you can actually use uh, Lexis codes to uh, create Lexstat and Lexi uh, jump links from your web page right into um, into the Lexis database and it'll prompt the user for the password. So you can start very small, um, but you, you need to start considering how are you going to take the uh, tools that are available on the internet, some for free and, and some for money, and uh, implement a solution at your school. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions uh, until our time runs out or, or until you need to leave. Just before we do questions, I wanted to very, very quickly give a footnote on something I didn't have time to cover before, and that's on GeoCities, which is that that's something that your students can go to when they want to create their web pages. So GeoCities is something that's free. You might refer that to them. If you could speak up a little bit. What are the pros and cons of letting the faculty individually choose what they want to do, whether it's doing a show or something like that? Uh, the question was, uh, what are the pros and cons to allowing faculty to uh, uh, choose uh, to go with Twin or to do their own private page or to participate in whatever the, the uh, law school solution is? Um, I don't know that there are any, really any drawbacks. I mean, I, I think the question may be, can you stop the faculty from doing it anyway? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, from my point of view, if they're using Twin, well, that's fine. Uh, I mean, I really need to direct their, their support burdens to Twin if I'm then supporting other, other pieces. If they're willing to go out on their own and uh, customize their own page, problems with that. Uh, what happens if it breaks and I need to support it? Uh, how are they going to give me access to it? So, I mean, there are those questions and you may just be in the position of saying, here's a really simple way to do it. And it's one reason you need to look at, at a solution. I mean, for example, Web Course in a Box, which is what I'm uh, looking at very heavily, has a nice offering inter interface for the faculty. They don't need to know very much. They don't even have to know where it sits. Um, and so I can really get out of business of having to go up and, and tweak a web page or fix uh, you know, a missing tag or whatever. Uh, Bill mentioned that you and I guess some of your colleagues post some of their material on the EDU site, some on the comp site, or other sites on the campus site. I'm wondering whether any of your institutions have established policies for faculty publishing on the, uh, on the school webpage or any limitations on the text games. You know, some schools are you know, concerned about faculty posting availability for consulting, mm -hmm. you know, deposit neural content on the EDU site. Our university has been very open about faculty doing almost anything they want. I wonder how long that can continue, but they've really had no rules. Um, in fact, the law school was more concerned when they were thinking about faculty putting their web pages on the law school server, and I reminded them that this had already been preempted since the university would let you put anything up, why the law school would be more restrictive didn't didn't make any sense. And I would add that since we don't have the Syracuse 7, so to speak, <laughs> at my institution, our school is particularly interested in other faculty members following my lead because the more that people do it themselves, then the less pressure there is on the staff. So that's a limitation that I think, as Lolly says, it may come in the future, but right now I don't anticipate it for some time. Um, actually, the, the three displays that I showed you, I have available only for the week that, that we're doing in the class, and then it is unlinked. It's not available on the web all the time. What I do is the outline is available, but not the graphics and that sort of thing. So for class display under Section 1101, you're allowed to do a whole lot of things for display that you may not, you may not choose to leave up. Uh, all the time. Uh, some of the commercial sites with their trademarks, they were thrilled for me to leave them up. I did talk with some of them. <laughs> they were this excited. might be a good time to work in, by the way, that uh, AT&T and presumably AOL have just shifted from the two megs free to five megs. Uh, I have about 35 pages, some of which have bunches and bunches of stuff on each page, and I'm just at about two, and I think it will take you know, a, a book-length thing to get to five. So uh, you have lots of, lots of space available now on those uh, AT&T and AOL, the commercial sites. Uh, one of the things that seems kind of compelling about the plan, at least from what I thought of yesterday, is the possibility of if you want to limit the access of your site to your own students, uh, plan to get to a single login that gives mm -hmm. the students the access to all the pages, all the courses, 
And um, I guess my question is sort of twofold. While I can hear the whole thing, uh, I can do it either way I want. The discussion list part in intellectual property is closed because that's a much bigger class. With 60 students, I didn't want everybody to participate. With a seminar, I didn't care if other people got in because I knew I'd recognize the names. <laughs> um, but you can, uh, with what our university does, you can limit the whole site. You can limit just pieces of it, whatever you want to do. The thing that concerns me, though, is if, you have, if you're taking five courses and they're closed portions or closed all, in five different proportions, it would be really nice to have a front end that permits a single username and password access. I think there's a limit to how many username and passwords uh, you give a student before it becomes a support issue of them getting them confused. Is there any way to put a front end on one of these? Um, it, it depends, I guess. Uh, with front-end and virtual classroom, I think both of them handle exactly what you're, you're wanting, which a student can create a page which links them to all the pages, whether they're open or closed. Um, if you're running your own web server, uh, you should be able to create a, a password account, which allows them to access based on passwords uh, particular sections. And that may be a little bit more administrative um, for you as a startup, but uh, I think it, it answers the same thing. They use the same password all the time. In the back. Uh, just the ability to put up a, uh, a calendar, a monthly calendar, a monthly glance, have people add entries so that, uh, say, you've got office hours every Tuesday and Thursday, students can come by and sign up for a particular time. Uh, and students following up after that can also check on it. It's not really like a global calendaring system. You know, I can't even tell you because it's through our simple start. You'd have to go click on that and then to the authoring part because it, they, it's something they provide. And you, like I said, it's password protected if you want it or it's open, but it is threaded. And I found that's really important. And that's what Twin gave me that I did not want to lose. And I would add that you can do a threaded discussion, not quite as slick as Twin yourself. If you have the ability to send an email, you can do your own. And I've laid out how to do that in the course materials for today. Yes. Yes. Yes, and it's instantaneous. I mean, five minutes before class, I can be doing stuff. That's what was a big plus for me. And it is direct access. What they've done is, and every student also, they've given every faculty member and every student so much space on the university server. And that's 23,000 students. <laughs> so. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Are you from North Carolina? <laughs> no. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you so much for being such a great audience.